Uh, you know, I'm excited to preach the word of God to you today. Lord. I can't promise you'll like what I have to say. Uh, but I hope you come back next week. Lord. You know, I've got a really simple lesson for us today. And yet, uh, sometimes the most simple lessons have the deepest teachings. Yeah. The title of my lesson today is simply The Attitudes of the Heart. Okay. Matthew chapter 5. You know, if you're visiting with us today, we believe the Bible is the standard for the church. It's not a good idea. It's not somewhat true. It's the foundation. Amen. I'm not the foundation. You're not the foundation. What you were taught and what your, what your family, culture, and heritage has believed about God over the past 200 years is not the foundation of God's church. The Word of God is. Jesus' yeah. teachings are the foundation of a biblical church. Wow. Matthew Bible? chapter 5. Verse 1, now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. You, you see, we got to always be ready to put ourselves in a position to preach the word. Amen. Yeah. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled. You see, the Bible makes something really clear. Not only here, but throughout the text. Whatever you long for is what you will receive. Amen. If you desire to change and to know God, that will happen. Yeah. But if you don't, don't be surprised when you get the thing that you really want instead. Mm. Verse 7, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, or a.k.a. the church. Verse 11, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is affectionately labeled in the Bible as the be attitudes. Why? Because they're the attitudes that need to be in your heart. Yeah. They are the be attitudes, not the have attitudes, not the sometimes exemplify attitudes, not the on a good day exemplify attitudes, not the when I feel like it, I belong to these type of attitudes, the be attitudes. These things need to be in our hearts. To give you a little bit of... Uh, some background information on a couple of these concepts. The Bible in verse 5 says, blessed are the meek. Probably one of the most profound definitions I've ever heard of meekness is power under control. Wow. Mm. There's an idea that's painted in our minds here. Blessed are the submissive. Wow. Well, that's not for one type of person or one gender or one group of, of society. That's for all of us. Yeah. Why? Because blessed are those who are submissive to the teachings of Christ. Amen. Blessed are those who are submissive to the person of Christ. Blessed are those that would rather have Christ live in their life than their own life. Wow. Mm. Come on, bro. Blessed are the poor in spirit. A lot of us don't like to be weak. But the Bible says when you're weak, then God can make you strong. Yeah. But before we go any further, we've got to ask ourselves, what does bless mean? I like to put bless in a box of, of words that we know what they mean, but we don't really know what they mean. <laughs> like righteousness, spirit, things like that. We're like, oh, I know what it means. But if somebody were to ask you to give a definition, you're like, yeah, it means, well, it's kind of like, so it's when this thing happens, and then we almost start defining the word with the word in the definition. Yeah. You can't give an accurate definition if the word you're defining is in the definition. On, Bless simply in the Hebrew, its roots of origin means superlatively happy. The Bible gives us the attitudes of the heart that we need in order to be happy. If I were to ask 10 people today, in any setting, if they want to be happy, if we took the cynics out, all of them would say yes. Why? Because nobody wants to be sad. Yeah. Nobody wants to be depressed. Nobody wants to work hard in their career, in school, in life, and then go home and go, what was the point of that? Yeah. And yet that's where so many people are because we're trying to pursue our own methods of happiness instead of having the attitudes of the heart that Jesus says, says leads to happiness. Yeah. Happy are the poor in spirit. What? Happy are the poor in spirit? Wait a minute. You know, I had a moment this week where I don't remember exactly what happened, 
But everything just kind of lined up. And I went, God is so good. Like, in, I was, it was just me in the room, right? And I was just like, wow, this is awesome. And then I went, wait a minute. Am I only this happy when everything works out? And I went, I, I, gotta, I gotta give myself some discipling here. I should be this happy no matter what. Because I've got a relationship with Jesus. And sometimes discipline comes from Jesus. And the Bible says that we should treat it as a father loving us. And that I should receive joy as the attitude of my heart when I go through trials. And I went, oh, so maybe when things are going really well, I should just kind of be happy. But when things are hard, God is so good. Uh, yeah, there's a reason why I'm not the guy for singing all the songs. <laughs> Verse 5 through 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. If there's anything God has convinced me of over the past couple of years is, if somebody goes, I really want to know Jesus, but there's no efforts being made. There's no longing in their heart. And they're the same person year after year, maybe even getting worse. They're lying. We're and maybe even they have deceived themselves. Uh, let me give you some uh, applicational examples that make sense. I asked the college students on Thursday night, I said, raise your hand if you go to the gym. So raise your hand if you go to the gym. Right, like somebody like, don't ask me that, because I, I can't raise my hand, don't, don't convict me. Now keep your hand up if you only go for five minutes when you go. Oh, well, 99% well. <laughs> of us, we don't only go for five minutes. Why? Because you won't see any results. You won't actually change. Why? Because if you put your life in all the things that you divvy out time and effort and resources to, most likely you're eating fatty foods a little bit more than you're going to the gym. Your protein intake is not that great, which for those of you that don't know, if you go to the gym, it's actually, you, you need to eat protein when you leave the gym. It's about what you put back in your body if you want to get some gains. So maybe you came to church today not knowing you're going to learn some, some gym etiquette and protocols, but there you go. In the same way, if you only go to church on a Sunday or you only show up to a Bible talk and you're expecting one or two hours of time to make up for all the other hours of things that you were doing that weren't helping your relationship with God, you are deceiving yourself. And one day you'll get bitter because you're going to go, I don't understand. I cleared my schedule on a Sunday to go to church. God, why are you doing this to me? And maybe God's going, I didn't do that to you. Yeah. You're the one taking in all the spiritual fatty foods at all the other times. And the Bible says God cannot be mocked. Yeah. Yeah. This just convicted me. Because it's made me take a look at my life and go, whatever area that I'm assuming I will somehow put this amount of effort into and receive this amount of blessing, I got to just take a harder look at my life and switch some things up so that I don't try to mock God but I have the right attitudes of the heart. If you hunger and thirst for righteousness, a promise from Jesus is that you will be filled. You know, uh, just to, to level with you, I came to church today uh, not having had as much breakfast as I should have, so I'm hungry right now. Yeah. Let me tell you, when the service is over, I will be filled. <laughs> because I'm going to go get some food. Maybe Subway. <laughs> the point is, if you want to be filled spiritually, you got to want it. Yeah. That's an attitude of the heart. It's not a mindset thing only. It's not a schedule thing only. It comes from here. You've got to want it. I appreciate Jair sharing communion today because when our heart's in that place, that's when you start to really want it. When you see your need for Jesus Christ. Verse, verse 10 it says, happy are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the church. Those are synonyms I, I put in there. The Bible says here that the church belongs to the persecuted. Wow. So if you're trying to be a Christian, if you're trying to live a godly life, but you don't want people to feel like your lifestyle is a judgment to them, good luck. Wow. We're not talking about actively judging people. But if you choose, hey, I'm not going to go to the party on Friday night and get wasted, a.k.a. wasting my life, I, I, I'm going to spend some time with, with my wife. And we're going to read our Bible together. 
I, I'm not going to go and be a, rush at a sorority fraternity just because everybody else is doing it. I'm going to be righteous because I want to be happy. I want a true relationship with God. You know, I got to look up Lucas. He's a part of a fraternity on campus, and frankly, they're like, this guy's righteous. Because they know if there's something worldly going on, he's not going to be there, or he's going to go and go, hey, you, you, why don't you come to church with me? Yeah. <laughs> but his life example is also uh, imitatable and inspiring. Why? Because he's one of the biggest guys in the gym. If you didn't know, Lucas can, can bench almost 400 pounds. Wow. That's like almost four of me. <laughs> Case in point. If you're going to be a part of God's church, if you're going to have a relationship with Jesus, you can't expect to not be hated when Jesus was hated for teaching the very things he says you need to believe. There it is. Yeah. Point number one, he made himself nothing. Wow. That was Jesus' attitude of the heart. Yeah. He made himself nothing. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. I'm constantly inspired by Jesus' example. Because I go, okay, so many of us, our actual power to change things is, is mid. It's somewhere right in the middle. We don't actually have much ability to do what we think we can do half the time. Yeah. Yeah. Yet Jesus had absolute power to do anything and everything at a moment's notice, but made himself nothing. Yeah. Yeah. But, but for some of us, we go, oh, well, you know, if I'm going to be fulfilled, I've got to be something. But if you're in Christ, you're already something. Yeah. You don't need recognition. You don't need a title. You don't need admiration. You don't need affection. You just need Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Philippians chapter 2. Right. Verse 1. Therefore, if you have any encouragement. The Bible says here, if you have any courage from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, any common sharing in the spirit, any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit, and of one mind. The word spirit is often, uh, can be translated purpose, your mindset, the reason why you're doing it, mental disposition. The Greek word is often pneuma. Being in, of one purpose and of one mind. Doing nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interests of others. You know, so many people want to talk about how to change the world and all the, the political machinations and and all the different things that, that need to be put into place for the world to change. But imagine how different our world would be if everybody looked not only to their own interests, but each of us to the interests of others. There, there is not many more, more accurately defining passages about Jesus' heart toward us, about Jesus' attitude of the heart, than that. Jesus left the comfort of heaven. A perfect relationship, no sin, took your sin, was separated from God, and died, and made himself nothing. Could you imagine the temptation? Go with me to Matthew 27, or 26 real quick. Keep your finger in Philippians 2, because we're going to come back there. Matthew 26, verse 50. Jesus replied, do what you came for, friend. Jesus was able to be fully submitted without having a bad heart. Wow. Then the man stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. You know, maybe some of us would go, yeah, Jesus would be real proud of me for that. <laughs> Fought for righteousness. This is Jesus' response. Put your sword back in its place. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. You know, I feel bad for Christians that feel the need to label other Christians with, with slander, name-calling, persecution, and ridicule. Because Jesus simply says, if that's how you choose to live, that's how you will die. Pers Christians do not persecute other Christians. Not if they're actually a Christian. If there's a group on campus speaking badly about another one, that's not, I'm not talking about defining scriptures about them. We're talking about there's slander and accusations in their heart. Perhaps they haven't really listened to Jesus here. Wow. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? 
Imagine the self-control Jesus needed. To go, I can end this suffering at any moment. Not only that, I have the right and could take vengeance on my oppressors. You know, some people believe that Jesus, in a certain way, was saying, I could destroy the world right now if I wanted to. Why? Because to the Jewish mind, an army of angels would have been like, whoa. Because one angel in the Old Testament destroyed like a whole army. Could you imagine, imagine thousands of angels? We get afraid sometimes when the police roll up on people. Could you imagine the destroying angels coming in droves? We're like, I'm just going to be quiet. But Jesus goes, I could do this at any moment. But this was the reason why he did it. Verse 54. But then how would the scriptures be fulfilled that say that it must happen in this way? That's the only attitude of the heart we need to have. My life needs to be a demonstration of God's word fulfilled. Not through miracles only. So many people, they go, oh, you know, God's worked in my life so much. God, this is proof of God in my life. But what about when things are hard? You have that same faith? Because frankly, if you have faith when, when the experience is high, but not when it's low, you don't really have faith. Because yeah. yeah. that's not faith. That's, that's an emotional high going, I believe in God when it's easy. Yeah. What about when it's hard? What about when God is testing your faith going, are you going to submit to me in this moment when I didn't have to take this away from you, but I chose to? Because I want to see if you're more concerned about the comfortability of your own life, your own priorities, your own prerogatives, or my word about Jesus, my son, being exemplified through your life. Go back to Philippians chapter 2. Let's go, bro. I'm only here today because over the last five years, the lesson I'm teaching you today, I have fought tooth and nail to ingrain into my very being. I've got a long way to go, but I'm not where I was. I think too many of us this morning, we want recognition. We need credit or we want to feel validated. We, we want everybody to know about our pain. But, but if everybody needs to know about your pain, then why do you need Jesus? Didn't you come to Christ because everybody knew about your pain already and it didn't solve anything? Jesus is the only person you need to be validated by. Yeah. I'll never forget, I, uh, I used to disciple a brother. I'm not going to say his name because you all know who he is. And he comes up to me one day. He goes, bro, I just don't understand. I'm so hurt because I put in all this work and nobody gave me any credit. I go, that's your problem. Yeah. You're only happy when somebody gives you the glory. But when you became a disciple of Jesus, you gave up that desire. Yeah. You gave up that need because you saw the black hole that it was. And I said, brother, you will be so much happier when you can do the work of God and somebody else gets the credit and you don't even care. Yeah. When, when you do all the work and you give the credit to somebody else, yeah. You give somebody else the victory. That's leadership, by the way. Yeah. That's leadership. As you do all the work behind the scenes, and then you give the guy that you're, you're helping train, you go, you give him the public victory and glory. That's true leadership. That's Jesus' true leadership. He put in all the work, and yet everybody talks about the apostles sometimes more than Jesus. Yeah. They go, well, Paul is so inspiring. He wrote all the books of the Bible. No, Jesus wrote the Bible. The Holy Spirit wrote the Bible. Christ's humility, it needs to be the attitude of our heart. Verse 5, in your relationships with one another, Philippians 2, verse 5, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Now, what I love about the Bible is there's not a title above this that says the great suggestion. <laughs> the great ideal. The great if you can find a way to do it, but don't preach too hard about it. You see, too much of church today has become about we're only going to read one verse because I don't want people to feel like the Bible's too hard. I don't want people to feel like they don't belong here. But if you're not a Christian, you don't belong in the church. That doesn't mean you can't be accepted in love. you got to hear me clearly here. But there is a dividing line between the people that are saved and are not saved. And a person that's not saved shouldn't feel like they are. Why? Because then what what's happening is their desires are being satiated by the ministers and by man. Instead of them having the brokenness to go, God,
God, I, I need you. I can't figure this out on my own. Your scriptures, Jesus laid his life down so that I could have this love letter to me. Help me understand how to put this into practice because I recognize that living a worldly life means I don't belong to the church. There's too many of us that are going, people need to believe and, and feel like they belong before they behave. You got to understand, one of the biggest churches in Florida teaches that from the pulpit, but Jesus doesn't. Mark chapter 1 says you got to repent and then believe the good news. Yeah. There's other passages just like this. We've got to understand, if we muddy down the transformation process, if we water down Jesus' conversion of our heart process, we're not going to actually experience the joy, the relationship that God has intended for us. You got to make yourself nothing. Verse seven, or sorry, verse six. Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality God something to be used to his own advantage. Wow, that that just hits me right here like a knife. Because so many of us, we we want to use things to our own advantage. But the Bible says Jesus made himself nothing. Verse seven. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a slave. Talk about a touchy scripture in our political climate. It doesn't matter what your culture is, nobody wants to be a slave. And nobody wants to be told they need to be one. I know I don't want to be told to be one. I, I, when I read the passage, I was almost a little angry. I was like, Jesus! But remember, either you're master of your life or Jesus is. Jesus is Lord is not a funny saying, a nice little slogan. That's the problem is nowadays too much of our Christianity is built on nice little slogans. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Is he? It, it, like that's something I ask myself a lot. You know, I say Jesus is my Lord. I say he's my Savior. But do I actually submit to Jesus as my Lord or do I just want the Savior part? Do I just want to be rescued when I totally blow it from doing things my own way even when I already knew the scripture because I heard it preached on Sunday? Wow. Jesus has got to be master. That's why you have to be servant, slave. There, there's no middle ground. Some of us, we're, we're vying for power with Jesus too much in our life, and then we wonder why we're not happy. You've got to make yourself nothing. If for no other reason other than that Jesus did it first. Verse 8, in being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. <laughs> Probably the most needed scripture for all of the world, especially America. He humbled himself by being obedient to death, even death on a cross. A lot, of, a lot of people say you don't actually have to obey the message. But the Bible here says Jesus exemplified humility through his obedience. Wow. Obedience is a matter of the attitude of your heart. People don't want to obey the scripture because they want Jesus as a little aftermarket bolt-on. They want Jesus as the spinners on, on the rims. Mm. It looks good. It's awesome. And people want to come up and talk to you about it, but it doesn't actually change the condition of the vehicle. After a while, they're just going to fall off, and you're going to wonder, what, what, what happened? Why? Because Jesus needs to be the engine. Jesus needs to be the oil. Jesus needs to be the gasoline. Jesus needs to be the thing that actually makes you work and run and motivated. But that takes humility. You've got to make yourself nothing. I want to give you guys a story. You know, I was really encouraged. Uh, God always works in great ways. Is I want to share a story about uh, the, the ministry that my wife and I went down to help build at FIU back in uh, 2018. Uh, and there's actually an FIU student in the room, so I was really encouraged. I was like, I'm going to share about this. You know, in 2018, we went down there. It was me and uh, about, about eight other people. Some of them went to the single professionals ministry, and then some of us went to campus. Later on, we were affectionately called the seven. I, I don't need the title. I just thought it was funny. And there was about seven of us in the campus ministry. And almost none of us were uh, Latino, which is what FIU is predominantly. It's a commuter school, and almost everybody that goes there it speaks Spanish as probably their first language. Well, let me tell you about something that we experienced frequently on that campus. We walk up to somebody to, to, to talk to them, even just to talk to them. If you don't talk to them in Spanish and they find out you don't speak Spanish, like, why are you talking to me? Wow. Seriously, that wearing the cross, wearing a Jesus shirt, and everything. Why are you talking to me? Yeah, yeah. Talk about a difficult ministry. 
You won't talk to me, even though you're repping Jesus, because I don't speak your language? But you know, there's a spiritual truth in that. A lot of people have a hard time connecting unless you're willing to speak their language. And language isn't just English, Spanish, French, Creole, German, whatever. It, it's the culture. It's their upbringing. It's the, the part of the nation that they're from, the things they experienced. And let me tell you something. We had to make ourselves nothing in order to just have one conversation sometimes with people. Now, we're college students, barely finishing college or having just finished or just started, and we're like, this is crazy. We're just kids. How do we do this? Well, we lived in a, in a house that was right across uh, over there in Sweetwater, and we called it the Wolfpack household because that's how we needed to be to share our faith. <laughs> so we went over there every day. Some of us got up at 2 a.m., went to work at 4, got off at 1, went home, showered, went back to campus, had our lunch, did our schoolwork, shared our faith, did Bible studies, went to the meetings, and then got home at 11 or 12 and started it all over again the next day. Yeah, some of us were not sleeping because we wanted to see God move, and we were willing to become nothing. And I can't say it was one person over the other because, frankly, it wasn't. It was a group, collaborative effort. I'll never forget the first guy that we baptized into Christ, uh, this young man. He was Chinese Panamanian. And, I mean, this guy just <laughs> swole. I was like, are there any shirts that fit you? Like, can you even wear a blazer? I, I, I don't, I'm not convinced. And he was a really endearing guy. He goes, oh, don't treat me like that, bro. <laughs> yeah, because... His, he has his uh, Chinese ancestry, so he just spoke very high pitch. And it was amazing because on one of our first college devotionals, we went down to baptize him, and then we found out something. The water level in the fountain was too shallow because the guy's muscles were too massive. Okay, so we're like, wow, what a, what a moment of glory. The only body of water that was anywhere close that made any reasonable sense to go to was the pond. Well, let me tell you about the pond. No water circulation. We got in, and immediately when we, we jumped in, oh, yeah, that's how we felt. Oh, man. We're like, guys, guys, let's get this on so we can get out of the water. Come on. So we baptized him in, into Christ, and it was almost like a jump, right? Because we could only touch the shore on, on like, the edge, right? There was, there was no, the bottom was deeper. I don't want to know what was down there. It was almost like we jumped in and slam dunk baptized him. It's literally, it was, it was, it was like, and then we all got out of the water, and i never forget, uh, we're married now, but we were dating at the time. Aww. She comes up to me, and she goes, honey, you, you smell really bad. <laughs> she didn't say honey, she said, she said, Jacob, you smell really bad. <laughs> and so we all rushed home, because we didn't want to discourage the women that were there. And we changed our clothes, took a shower, and celebrated his baptism. <laughs> then we baptized another guy. Then we baptized a PhD student. Wow. That is the only person I've ever seen who needed a rebuke during our cross study came from the Jewish faith, and he was like, oh, Jesus isn't. And I'll never forget, a brother comes in, and he goes, you're the most prideful person I've ever seen on planet Earth. And the guy goes, oh my gosh, you're right. And he got baptized a couple days later. <laughs> <laughs> we baptized this other guy, who was a Spanish, uh, Spanish speaker. And then the moment of glory disappeared. We come home, and uh, we, we find this letter on one of our vehicles, four-page letter of, of all these slanderous accusations uh, about one of the brothers in, in our household. And we discovered it before he did, and we were like, oh my gosh. And basically, the guy uh, decided that he no longer wanted to follow Jesus, but in his mind was still following Jesus and had all these just monstrous things to say about um, our household, about what we were doing on the campus, and about the fact that, uh, that, he, that we baptized him. He's like, I didn't need to be baptized. I'm like, then why did you agree to it? Like, come on. Stop blame shifting here. I'll never forget the sadness that overcame the household for a moment. Not because we were all sad, but because we were heartbroken for our brother. You know, we frequently had sat down at least once a week and took communion together as a household because we wanted our hearts to stay right because it's, it's hard to make yourself nothing. It's hard because the old you tries to fight to come back to life. And every part of us is like, is this worth it? Why do we got to keep doing this? We don't have to do this to be saved, so why do it at all? But we kept recommitting ourselves to the cause. 
you know, it was another, another one of those brothers uh, moved up north to be part of our church there. And uh, the next thing we know, we're, we're getting a, a letter because how he was asked to leave because of how violent he had gotten toward the members of the church and how he became better at taking people out of God's church than he ever was at bringing people in. That was hard. The other guy, uh, he goes out to pursue his further education at our, at our sister church in, in Texas. And the next thing we know, all we hear is he, he just he left the faith. I remember my wife and I, after we got married, uh, we got married after a couple months of being there in Miami. We graduated and then got married, amen? Um, we studied the Bible with this, uh, this dating couple. And we're like, hey, you know, here's, we want to share our story with you. Come over for dinner. We shared with them about the purity and the scriptures that we chose that we said we're going to be real Christians here. We're, we're not going to sleep together. We're not going to lust after each other. Our first kiss is going to be at the altar, and it was. We shared that with them, not in a condemning way, but like, hey, you know, like we're really inspired by how God worked in our life. The uh, young man immediately after they left our house apparently went and proposed to her. <laughs> I was like, ah, whatever. I don't know if that's, if, <laughs> if that's the greatest backdrop to propose to somebody. But and then he decides he, he doesn't really want to have purity like that. I was like, okay, we're not a cult, bro. You can do whatever you want. But we're, we're going to teach people about the Bible's Jesus. Yeah. So his, his girlfriend, now fiance, continues studying the Bible. She's preaching the word to him. She's coming out to everything, and, and in many ways, she became a daughter in the faith to my wife. And then uh, she faced the scriptures that talk about how Christians don't date non-Christians. Disciples don't date non-disciples. Why? Because the wisest man on the face of the planet, the Bible says, was drawn astray because he was unequally yoked in a relationship. That's the Bible standard. It's not a good idea. It's prideful to think that you can marry somebody, date somebody, and convert them. It's prideful to think that. It's hard enough to convert your own heart. Yeah. Let alone somebody else. You can't make anybody do anything. Well, it's just my faith. Okay, if you want real faith, follow the scriptures. Yeah. That's real faith. Making the hard decisions, trusting that God loves this person more than you do. I'll never forget. I get a phone call one day. I was like, oh my gosh. How dare you tell people that they can't have sex with their girlfriends? And be a Christian. How dare you tell people they have to break up to, to actually do it Jesus' way? He starts yelling at me. You guys, I don't even remember what he said because I just kind of tuned it out. And I remember simply saying to him very pointedly, hey man, and I was shaking, right? This was scary. But I remember going, this might be my only chance to be righteous in the face of unrighteousness. I said, hey man, do you really feel like this is how Jesus would have treated somebody? And he hung up on me. <laughs> you know, for the college students, got him. <laughs> but that wasn't my intention. My intention is this guy's lost. He clearly is deceived. Yeah. And the only way he's going to see it is if somebody stands up for it boldly. Yeah. We're not talking about being mean. We're not talking about being unloving. We're not talking about being judgmental. We're talking about having conviction in a world that even in many church atmospheres goes, the only real conviction you should have is to act like you have none. Yeah. What's amazing is Hannah and I, uh, you know, we got sent out to Ohio. We were asked to go uh, help support the church. There we go. And then, uh, you know, it was even harder for the women on campus because sadly the, the women were, uh, their hearts were even harder than the men. And... We get a phone call that my wife, a friend that she had reached out to and invited to church, got baptized in Christ. And it was a moment for us. I, you know, it was like, wow. And then, you know, people, some of the people you know, like Melanie, now in Guncho, people like that were converted from that girl and from that person who simply shared her faith because she was Hispanic and people would listen to her. Yeah. So it only took one. But let me tell you, that group is, is now about 200 people. And some of us were never there for the glorious moments. And we didn't need to be. But let me tell you, that's what it takes sometimes to help even one person overcome the world. You've got to become not, you've got to be sometimes the only Jesus they will ever see. And we fall very short of the standard, but we've got to be willing to make ourselves nothing. 
You know, the, the, it's very similar to the passage in the Bible that talks about how some will sow the seed and others will reap it. Others will reap the benefits of this. The college students there will never know. The long nights and the tears. The foundation of that group was not the seven of us. It was our prayers. It was our tears. It was our perseverance. It was our decision that we're going to do it Jesus' way, even if we have to make ourselves nothing. We came back two years later, and we didn't know anybody in the campus mission. But that was a good thing. It was challenging, but it was a good thing. Why? Because let me tell you about some of the people that did stay faithful. Alex and Gunjo. David Moreno. Juan Carlos Arias. Alex and Mel are now leading a church. Evangelist. Zach Dryden, leading a church. Evangelist. Austin Devine, leading a church. Evangelist. I can keep going. Juan Carlos, leading a church in a foreign country. Evangelist. The brothers and many of the people in that household and the people converted went on to do glorious things, not because it was our own strength, but because the foundation was we made ourselves nothing. And that's what needs to exist in Gainesville. We've got to make ourselves nothing so that our ministries can look and have the power of Jesus, not our own. Not our own. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. What are you holding on today that's keeping you from this call? What relationship do you know is not biblical, but you're holding on to it? What standard of life are you holding on to that you you go, I I can't give this up, there's no way. I won't be happy if I give this up. I hear what the preacher's saying. You've got to make a decision today. Either you live and are something, or you die so Christ lives and you become nothing. Galatians 2 verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I can't wait to the day where everybody in this room, where we can say that confidently. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. And one of the things I I didn't share about was, uh, I I remember sharing my faith with this individual. I didn't didn't know what he was. Turns out he was a professor on the campus. And I'm in the student union. And he's like, oh, you guys are sharing your faith. Cool. Uh, And he asked me a question about a scripture. And he goes, what do you think? I said, well, you know, my my best understanding of the scripture is if you actually read a couple verses a little bit further, you'll get the context. And then he starts screaming at me on the middle of the campus. I'm like, dude, you're on staff here. You can get fired for this. If nothing else, at least, at least like save your job. And he starts screaming at me, you don't know what you're talking about. And it comes to a moment where I just go, hey, you know what, sir? This conversation is going in an ungodly direction. We're, we're not supposed to be arguing like this as Christians. Um, it, it's clear you don't really want to hear anything I have to say. You're convinced uh, of your own thought. It's okay but I'm going to shut the conversation down. I hope you have a great day. People like you always do that. Okay, so now I'm being labeled, right? But it doesn't matter because in Christ, we are dead. There's no rights you need. There's no acclamation you need. There's no recognition that you need. People can treat you however you want. You go, now I understand why Jesus was able to do it because he made himself nothing. You know, if you've been baptized into Christ, the Bible says you are dead. A dead person has no rights. There's no therapy afforded them. There, there, there's no uh, special accommodations. They're dead. They're dead. There's no desires. Only Christ's desires that live through them. You know, simply put, this is why a refusal to share our faith and to use our talents and to live out the most fundamental elements of Christianity is a salvation issue. Because if you're alive, Christ is not. And the Bible says, when we've been saved, we're dead and Christ is alive. So if you resurrect yourself, then Christ in you dies. And if Christ is not in you, you have no salvation. It's a salvation issue that we deal with our hearts, that we kill the desires that don't don't perpetuate the desires of Christ, that we kill the wants that don't perpetuate the will of God so that we can be dead so that Christ can live through you. Luke 5, verse 32. Still with me? I only got two points today, so bear with me. Luke chapter 5, verse 32. 
Let's get a head start in verse 27. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said. And, and Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. You know, this is the point where everyone goes, see, Jesus was a friend to sinners. Yeah, Jesus fellowship with sinners, but he didn't sin with them. That's what we've got to have a deep conviction about. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their cult complained to his disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You understand, if you're visiting with us, I'm encouraged that you're here. But the foundation of our church is not to build a, 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 another church on this campus and in this city that's filled with self-righteousness. Where we're already good to go, and we just join a membership, we decide to give some of our money, but the issues of our heart, the foundations of whether or not we've actually put biblical salvation into practice isn't talked about, we're not willing to go there, and why are you going to judge me like that, brother? We talk about the real issues in this church. Why? Because if we're not careful, we'll be a church that's no different than how God views the world. Lost. Self-righteous. I don't know about you. I don't invest my time, my mind, and my dime into God's church to lose. Yeah. To be told that I didn't do it the right way. Right. I've invested too much. I'm not going to quit now, but you better believe I'm going to fight to do it the Bible's way. I don't care if another way looks more attractive. I guarantee you it does. Maybe you came in here and you're like, I don't know about this room. But okay, but what about your heart? Your heart needs to look more beautiful than the condition of anything going on around us that our ministries are perpetuating. Today, I have a simple call for you as we transition to point number two. Stay dead. Simple. Stay dead. It's not about you anymore. Point number two, faithful to the end. Go to Matthew 27. Faithful to the end. You know, it's awesome when a person becomes a Christian. But you know what's even more incredible? When they die one. <laughs> I don't know about you. I don't want to start the race and not finish it. I heard a joke one time. I'll tell it to you guys. You know, there's this thing about running a Boston Marathon. And this guy comes up. He goes, oh, you ran the Boston Marathon. Uh, did you win? And he goes, no, no. I was like, no, did you win? He goes, no, I, I was like 15. Sounds like he lost. Maybe you shouldn't go around sharing that with people. <laughs> and the guy was dumbfounded. Why? Because so much of, of our life we're taught, like, it doesn't matter how hard you try as, as long as you're kind of sort of doing it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not diminishing. If you're running a marathon, that's epic. And you should do that, right? The point of a marathon is not to win the marathon. But the Christian race is not actually a marathon. It's a sprint. There are elements of a marathon in it. But in a sprint, you are actually expected to place in a certain rank. In a marathon, you're not. And a lot of us, were too okay going, yeah, you know, I know I should repent of this. But it doesn't really matter. At least I'm going to church every week. At least I'm getting discipling on some things. At least I'm not doing with this other person. You know what that's called? Self-righteous. I think more of us need to develop a spiritual competitive edge. Not where we're, we're in competition with one another, but we're in competition with the old us yeah. that has died, that's trying to come back to life and go, don't try so hard. You don't actually need to do that. Why don't you go hear a smoother message somewhere else? Why don't, why don't you just do whatever you've got to do to get by so you can live comfortable Christianity? But there's a reason why that phrase is not in the Bible. Faithful to the end. Why are we talking about this? Because I'm not talking about making it to the end. I'm talking about being faithful to the end. Yeah. Could you imagine if I went up and my wife and I were 70 years old and I said, you know, we've been married for 50 years. And at least we made it. Nobody's inspired by that, really. If I start to tell them the details, yeah, like she doesn't really like me anymore. But we at least held to the promise. Okay, is that really how you want to go out? No. Is that how you want to live your Christianity? No. That's not how I want to live my Christianity. Half-hearted, halfway, and then I'm the guy that you know. The Bible says some will make it as those barely escaping the flames. 
I do not want to be the guy that steps into the gates of heaven and I'm going like this and the angels are going and I'm like, woo! <laughs> Made it! <sighs> What's up, Peter? And everyone's just kind of going, hey, man. Hey, man, bro. Tried to tell you. <laughs> At the end of the day, if you made it, you made it. Why do it halfway? Faithful to the end. I want to be able to die where my wife's got my hand. My hand in hers. And we're like, <laughs> we didn't just put up with each other. We figured out how to love each other. And our relationship's greater now than it's ever been. And I'm just, that's, that's what I'm fighting for. But the only reason why I have the strength to do that is because I care for that even more so in my relationship with God. You will never have the strength to be a good husband, a good spouse, a good girlfriend, a good boyfriend, if you don't even do the, the standards of the Bible to have a relationship with God the right way. My wife sent me this image. You might not be able to see it, but I thought it was uh, interesting. I felt a little convicted when she sent it to me. So, uh, you might not be able to see it, but it's this picture of the father with a plant coming out of his head, and he's watering the plant that comes out of the, the wife's head, and she's watering the plant, uh, the seedling that's coming out of the child's head. And the caption is, a good family starts with a good man, right? That's why I was convicted. I was like, oh, what is she trying to tell me? When a good man... <laughs> She later told me, she told me later, she said, oh, honey, I just thought it was cool. I was like, oh, praise God. When a good man is good to his wife, it goes down to his children, and the whole family is blessed. Wow. Right? Wow. Amen. Um, I want to give you a story. But before I do that, let's read Matthew 27. From verse 45. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If you drop down to verse 50, it says, and when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. John's parallel account records him as the phrase he said here being, it is finished. Faithful to the end. That's your only goal to be able to have your last dying breath going, it is finished. That's the greatest example Jesus set for us. He made himself nothing and then was faithful to the end. Yeah. I want to share with you a story. You know, eagles, they, they live out their certain uh, span of lifetime. But when they get to be a certain age, there's a moment that where they have a choice to pull out basically all of their feathers so that their life can be almost renewed. Let me show you a scripture about this. Go to Psalm 103. God thought it was such uh, an appropriate spiritual concept that it made it into his word. Psalm 103.5, the Bible reads, God is one who satisfies you with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. What this is talking about is when the eagle pulls out their feathers, there's a sense of rejuvenation that the eagle experiences even after having lived the majority of its life a certain way. For those of us that have been around for a little while, maybe it's time to pull out your feathers. Maybe it's time to let God rejuvenate you, give you a different outset. Even if you've lived your life a certain way up to this point, and it wasn't necessarily broken, but God wants to renew you so that you have the strength to be faithful to the end. You know, the challenge for all of us today is to not simply persist in our church presence and attendance, but to keep our heart in the right place. Luke 14, 25 to 34, you can turn me there real quick. Yeah, you know, I gotta lift up Ugoma, who uh, is getting baptized today. Let's go! Luke 14, verse 25. It says, large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father, mother, wife, children, brother, sister, yes, even their own life. See, we have to become nothing. Such a person cannot be my disciple. The Bible makes this a salvation issue. Don't get confused. There's no difference between a disciple and a Christian in the Bible. 
The Bible defines it. They're the same thing. They're the same. There's no such thing as a super Christian. Don't, don't, don't get that mistaken. Right? Too many of us from the Dragon Ball Z generation are like, well, there's, there's the heroes and then there's the super Saiyan Christian. Like, no, 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 no. You're either a Christian or you're not. Yeah. You're a disciple and a Christian or you're not a disciple and you're not a Christian. Yeah. And Jesus goes, you can't be a follower of mine if you love your life. And if you love your family and your relationships more than you love me. Sorry, I, I actually don't wish it was different ways. Too many pastors and preachers are, are apologizing for what the scriptures say. I'm not going to apologize because this is what your heart actually needs so that you can be content, so that you can be happy, so that you can be healed. But when we apologize publicly for what the scripture says, we're demeaning and undermining Jesus, our very Savior. Don't do that. Verse 33 simply says, you must give up everything you have. Yeah. I'm really inspired because, uh, you know, I didn't ask her if I could share it, so I'm not going to. But when, when you goma, what this passage says, counted the cost. She asked my wife about some situations where, where it could be very dangerous for her to hold to the commitment of the scriptures. And we had to look at her, that's the cost. And she goes, okay, well, if I have to, I'll, I'll call you and I'll get a, I'll get a ride from you. And we'll deal, we'll deal with whatever needs to be dealt with. That's the heart of somebody that's ready to be baptized. Yeah. Whatever it takes, because our life is nothing. Acts 14, 22, as we close out. Uh -huh. And I got to really lift up Ugoma because uh, my, my wife shared with me. I said, hey, you know, how'd the last Bible study go? And she said, I, I've never studied the Bible with somebody whose heart was just so ready to, to, to live out the scriptures and had no problem with what the Bible said. Wow. And too many of us, I think, are trying to convince people that are not open to the gospel to be open to the gospel. Yeah. You need to do that. <laughs> but we also need to focus our time on finding the people that are not going to argue about it, but that are ready to receive it. Why? Because when a person argues about what the Bible says and how to apply it into their life because of their past experiences, they don't recognize that they are the sick person in need of help. Could you imagine that? You go to the doctor, and the doctor goes, hey, I, I really need you to take this medication uh, because you, you have the flu. I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. You're probably wrong. The doctor's going to be like, all right, well, you know, have a good day. Here's the prescription. Get out of my office. But that's how we treat the Bible sometimes. The scriptures are illuminated in our life. We go, I don't really think that applies to me. We become the person that has no clue that there's this big, festering thing on our arm, and somebody's trying to save us. No, I'm good, bro. Yeah. Acts 14, verse 22. I'm inspired by uh, Ugoma and, and her desire to follow Jesus the way the Bible says because she, she was committed to doing it even if it meant hardship would come her way. And it reminds me of this scripture. Acts 14, 21. They preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith, saying, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. I want to inspire you today. There's no easy Christianity. You must become nothing. The attitudes of the heart mentioned in the Bible need to be the attitudes of your hearts. You've got to become nothing and become faithful to the end so that not only can you live the Christian life on this earth, but so that you will actually be in heaven with God. Thank you.